very much, uh, Vanessa. It's always a pleasure to help out with these uh, webinars. Uh, the one thing I like about the Canadian Centre for Men and Families is it's uh, really supportive of men going through difficult times without being um, uh, overly obnoxious about it, if that's a better, <laughs> I'm going to get myself in trouble, I'm sure, for the way I say things. Anyway, so this is a good start to a seminar on communication. Uh, bottom line is, I guess you don't have to be perfect. Uh, in any event, um, I wanted to uh, welcome also Tannis Moore here. This is uh, great that she can participate. And, and uh, there's her picture here, if you uh, need that one, I'm not sure why that. Anyways, I'm gonna just to, as an introduction for the uh, evening, escalation. Recent 2022 case in the Alberta Court of Queen's Bench, it was up in Edmonton. And this is what the judge had to say about the father in this case. His manner of communication and tone in many of his electronic messages with the mother can only be described as manipulative, controlling, and argumentative. And um, here's an, a sample of uh, one of the texts uh, or emails that he sent uh, to uh, the mother in the case. And you can see that he was clearly frustrated. Uh, it looks like there were some uh, allegations of violence but at the end of this he says because you are escalating and refusing to admit it and refusing to change uh and unfortunately for this gentleman uh he lost his case and i think when you read the case it becomes clear that his communication style played a huge part in the judge decision and um mom was allowed to move down to the other side of the continent in the states uh, with their young child so I'm going to turn it over to um, Tannis, and uh, she'll talk about some of the underlying psychological stuff um, that uh, gives you a different perspective on how to communicate. All right. So the first thing that I thought would be really helpful to uh, go over here is something called the drama triangle. And for those not familiar with the drama triangle, basically these are different ways of relating to other people that are likely to lead to some forms of drama in your relationship. So these are the styles of relating that we really want to avoid. So I thought we could kind of briefly um, just kind of go over what each of these things look like and how they manifest in people's lives. And oftentimes you might find yourself moving between different, different ones of these relation or, uh, of these relationship styles but um so let's kind of just get into it so at first we have the the persecutor here and so basically this can kind of be summarized as i am right do what i say so this is somebody who's very, you know, overbearing. Um, they maybe are prone to yelling or showing anger. They may be very like dominating or rigid in their communication styles. Um, they tend to use, you know, fear and intimidation to try and get their way in others. Um, so, you know, you, you think of, you think of this, you think of somebody with like steam blowing out of their ears. So that is one you really want to kind of avoid. Um, another one here is the rescuer. Um, and, you know, you think rescuer, you think, oh, but that's that's a good thing. But no, this this is basically the kind of person who wants to solve all the other person's problems and, and control things for them. So, you know, you need my help. Let me fix you. That kind of It, it kind of creates feelings of, you know, being better than somebody else. So like, I, I know better than you. Um, I can, I can help solve your problems for you rather than solve problems with you. Um, you know, they, they tend to uh, have strings attached in, in saving, saving the other person, saving, um, and they use feelings of indebtedness and superiority to get their way. And then finally, the last one is the victim in, in the drama triangle. And, you know, you people might be, you guys might be familiar with this one um, because it, it's the, the kind of, I'm helpless, please rescue me kind of attitude, you know, um, somebody might put on this kind of facade of, you know, of helplessness. Uh, they don't take accountability for their actions. Um, it's really a lot of, um, 
it's it's always your fault. It's never my fault. That kind of thing. Um, so the victim will will not take action and will rely on others to fix their problems. Um, and then we can kind of move to the next slide. And this other slide here is the winner's triangle. And this is basically more productive ways of relating to others and having those kind of communication patterns that are less likely to lead to drama and are more likely to create positive relationships with other people. So in the, the top corner here, we have the assertive, and it can also be called the advocate. Um, but basically, they address issues as they arise and refuse to let the resentment build. Um, a lot of times in, in communications that, that really become negative, they, they've grown negative over a long period of time, right? Because both parties have let that resentment build. So being the assertive advocate, um, they, they address those things quickly as, as they arise. Um, so there's a lot of self-awareness. Um, they act on behalf of themselves without harming others. So, you know, very much unlike the, the persecutor, um, they're, they're, advocating for themselves, but without being overwhelming to other people. Um, they don't act in a punishing way and they say no when they're needed, but is willing to work with others. So there's a lot more collaboration there. Um, and then the next one, in, instead of, you know, the, the rescuer kind of approach is instead the, you know, nurturing, caring coach kind of, um, kind of role. And so basically that's somebody who's willing to, you know, teach concepts, but to show people like you can do this for yourself. It's it's not trying to rescue them and save them and I can do this for you. It's okay, well here, here's how we can do things together. Um there's again, you know, And then last but not least is the, the vulnerable um, creator role instead of the victim role. And so this is somebody who, you know, they, they, they take action to create the life that they want. They recognize their own strengths and weaknesses and they're willing to, you know, talk about that sort of thing. Um, but without making it somebody else's problem, right? So they will um, assertively ask for help when needed. And they're willing to take risks after looking at the consequences. So they have kind of an I can attitude rather than an I can't or I won't attitude. Um, and so all of these people, all of these different roles on the winner's triangle, um, these are uh, much more effective ways of relating to others. And, you know, in a legal situation, just generally, they're, they're going to be more likely to lead to positive outcomes. So we can move on to the next slide. Um, so there are some other kinds of things to talk about with regard to, you know, regulating your emotions in, in, a, in various situations you might encounter. Um, so a, a real focus on self-awareness is, is a big one. So, you know, focus not necessarily on what the other person is doing, but more on, you know, on yourself, on what you're doing. Um, this is kind of something I like to refer to as an internal locus of control. Um, so by going into meetings with people with a focus of, um, I am going to achieve X and will do Y behavior instead of, you know, maybe, for example, my ex is just out to get me, then you can hone in on things that, you know, that you can do rather than a focus on things that are out of your control. So that's, that's a, a, a really big one. Um, so the next one is like with, with controlling your emotions, it's, it's kind of the similar sort of thing, right? Um, so there are a couple of different ways that, that you might, um, there are some different strategies to controlling one's emotions. Um, so one common one that, you know, it, it sounds trite, but it's actually really effective is to take deep breaths. So taking in a, a really deep breath and counting to five or 10 before responding to some 
to something. So if, if you encounter something that causes a lot of stress, then really taking time to like actively separate your mind from the situation and take that deep breath, it requires a like a direct commitment to a clear action rather than reacting in anger. So you're you're not you're not just you know, action. And by doing that, you kind of separate yourself a little bit from, from the anger or whatever emotion you might be feeling in that moment. Um, so it allows you to kind of keep that control of yourself and roll with what happens rather than losing yourself in the throw of anger. Um, this breathing time can also be useful in taking time to frame another person's actions. So when we react in anger, we often jump to assuming the worst intentions of the other person, um, especially when they've said something hurtful or that has made us feel angry, right? So if we instead try and take the time to think about some other reasons why they may have said something, it may allow us to humanize them and therefore be less likely to lash out in anger and more likely to be willing to try to collaborate. So... Yeah. And again, a, a really big important section of this is to focus not on what the other person is doing, but on yourself. Because a lot of times, you know, in, in, in not in just in this situation, but even in any kind of situation, if you think about it, you can't really predict what the people around you are going to be doing. So especially in a in a high high conflict legal scenario, you can't you can't predict what the other person is going to do, not not with any amount of certainty. So if you're really sitting there focused on what they're going to do, um, then you know you're you're kind of at their mercy. you're you're not really in control of yourself. So that's why I say, if if you have a specific plan about what you're going to do and and the ways you're going to act and what your strategy is then you know you you can go into that meeting with much more control than you would otherwise have yeah so basically you can control how you're reacting to other people i'm kind of jumping ahead of the ahead of the script here but yeah, you, you can control how you're reacting to other people. And, and controlling your reactions is so important because as Charles showed at the very beginning, you know, that, that kind of communication style really looked like somebody who is, you know, they're really reacting to what's going on around them. They're not, they're not, um, they're not in control of their own emotions. So when you have that kind of a situation, well, I mean, you saw what happened. That fellow unfortunately lost his case. Um, they're 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 not going to see you as somebody who's in control, and that's going to ref going to reflect badly on you in a court case. Into um, a case with a commitment to solving a problem, then you think you can think about the scenario not as you versus your ex or you versus whoever it, whoever else it may be that you're in a legal situation with. You can think of it as the two of you working to solve a problem instead, right? So if you go into it thinking of it that way, then you can kind of separate yourself from the conflict that you may be having with the other individual and instead think, okay, so what is the problem that has brought us all here together? What are we coming here to solve? And automatically by thinking of it that way, you can start to move yourself out of that combative role and into a problem-solving role that, that will allow you to feel, you know, as, as much as is feasible in many of these situations, more collaborative with the other person, right? So, yeah. Hey, Tannis, can I ask you a question? Yeah, please do. Um, so uh, going back to these other slides here on the, let me just go all the way back here. This is a, the, on this drama triangle. Um, if somebody is in one of these roles, are they stuck in that role uh, or how, or do they, are they always in that role or do they move between these roles? 
oh no, they, they definitely move between those roles. And sometimes they will do it deliberately as well. You know, somebody may move from, you know, a um, the, the persecutor role into the victim role when, if they think that it's, you know, expedient for them in the situation. And some people are actually very good at it. And, you know, it's, it's important not to hop on the triangle with them when they're doing that, right? Because a lot of the times, if you have somebody, you know, behaving, say, in a victim role, it can be really easy to react with them in a negative way, right? But Like, um, a, like a, the rescuer role or something like that? Yes. Yeah, exactly. So, so trying to avoid that kind of thing and, you know, keep yourself on the winner's triangle when somebody else is jumping on the drama triangle is, is a really key factor in um, keeping control over those scenarios. But yeah, it's, it's very easy for, for somebody to be moving around on, on, on these things. In fact, quite common. I, I would say it's, it's rare that somebody only sits themselves in one um, one of these slots forever, right? So, so does that mean that you can switch to this role as well? Oh yes, and this is something that I talk about a lot in in like my own experiences in therapy. It's how can we move from you know these kinds of behaviors on the drama triangle? How can we kind of shift that and in, into being on the winner's triangle and and make your behavior more effective in relating to the other person to make your relationship. Right. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. I'm going to just, I'm going to go through all these slides again. Great. Thank you for that. So, so here's a, um, I don't know, there's a real text, a, a, sorry, a real case of mine a few years ago where a, a, the series of text messages showed up in, um, in a, uh, an affidavit. You can see here, uh, not quite the best kind of language here. Um, the, uh, um, you can kind of guess, I was representing the guy who's writing with the white background and um yeah his partner was on the the uh, the right but i you know she didn't really deal with this uh too well either you know she says i'm turning my phone off and he says well do whatever you want i don't uh don't care uh well she didn't quite turn her phone off <laughs> so <laughs> and then and then he finishes it off with a lovely apologize at the end of it i you know what i was able to do with this particular uh, client is is coach him on much better ways of of um, uh, texting and he was he was actually it was painful to him you know he said look here here's how you uh, how you send a text dealing with something uh, and, you know, he'd type it into his phone and he'd sit there, we'd talk about it for five minutes and then before he finally pressed send. But then eventually, after about three exchanges, it, it, it de-escalated the conflict and it started to make a huge difference in his case. So I wanted to just go through uh, some uh, basic uh, communication tips. And these are somewhat related to the, the, the drama triangle and the winner's triangle that we've uh, been talking about. Um, and it, some of it is, is uh, uh, being clear on what it is that you want um, and what are your options. And, and this is important because sometimes what you might feel like doing is just getting back at the other person. And, and you think, well, wait a second, is that really what I want? Or is it what, it, what I really want is a healthier um, uh, co-parenting arrangement? What are the options uh, for getting there? And, and so it's good to, to spend some time thinking about that. Another thing that's important, and this is partly how you shift, I think, from one of those uh, triangles to the other is create safety and clarify your purpose. So you wanna make it safe for somebody to shift the role from whatever negative role they're in to something else. Um, and this can be done in writing and in, and in person. This one here is important. Understand you are responsible for your own actions and not the other's actions. You know, this is goes along with what Tannis was saying. You can't really predict what other people uh, are going to do. You also can't control what they're, they're going to do. We can only control our own actions. We can't control... Think or what they're going to feel. You can't control any of that. But if you're responsible for your for your own actions, making sure that they are 
the right actions in the situation and that you're responsible for your own happiness and they're not responsible for your own happiness, then uh, it's a nice way to start. Now, turning to um, some actual written communication um, uh, tips. So what I like to do is I, I like that this uh, rule I came across a number of years ago called the three sentence rule. So when you're sending an email or a text, you've got to keep it really, really short. Three sentences, maybe four, and I'll tell you where the where the, the fourth sentence might slide in. Okay, so the first, number one, state your request in one simple statement. Like, um, uh, I would like to uh, be able to pick up the kids a little bit earlier today would be your simple statement. Well, if that just pops out of nowhere, um, or today or tomorrow, I mean, you also want to be thinking about when is it reasonable, you know, uh, to put this uh, request out there, but say, you'd say, I'd like to uh, pick up the kids a little earlier tomorrow. Well, the question is why? Um, the, then you provide any information that the other side would reasonably need in order to make a decision. So, um, and, and we'll get into a little bit more about this in detail. So you could say, well, because I would, uh, there's a, um, a special program that starts at five o'clock. And if I pick the, the kids up at five o'clock, we're going to miss that uh, special program. The, and you don't need to say anything else. And then you say, state what you would like them to do. And this one um, is important. You would say something like, um, um, uh, let me know if uh, that would work um, or if you have any uh, concerns. This is really where you want to say, this is not the demand, you know, um, that you are saying, look, you know, I, I I demand that you that you uh, let me pick up the kids earlier. This is um, let me know what your response is, and you're inviting a discussion. One of the reasons why you want to do that is because it shouldn't matter to you what their response is, because as we said, we can't control what they're going to do. They have a choice. They can either do the right thing, which is provided that they don't have some. Uh, some program that the kids are in that's ending at five that uh, would require the, uh, you know, um, uh, yeah, so that's the, um, uh, so that, again, you, you want to get that input from them or you want to get that, that reaction so you can have a discussion. As I said, it doesn't matter what they, um, you can't control what they do if they come back and say well this is ridiculous that you would even think about asking them earlier how outrageous is this uh, behavior uh well then you can use that against them potentially in court because that's not a, a healthy productive way of uh, interacting so um here's some things to avoid and this is in particular in the um the second sentence which is things they need to uh know saying why it's important to you because quite frankly they probably don't care why it's important to you okay and and you know yes it's important to you but just set that aside you don't need to express it to them because you may just be inviting them to uh be uh to attack and this is where i think say the victim role comes in it's important to me and you you throw yourself under the bus and, and you're just inviting somebody to jump all over you. So it really isn't relevant um, why the, the, your request is important to you. Okay. Second big thing to avoid is appeals to authority like your lawyer. What's interesting about this is it actually weakens your case. Your, ca your, your request should stand on its own without having to appeal to authority. And when you, when you do appeal to authority, it sounds like you're being a little bit of a bully or that persecutor, that, that drama triangle. And that's more likely to get a, a, a response that you're not going to like. You don't need to appeal to authority. And besides, if you want to talk about what your lawyer has, has told you, 
you're violating solicitor client privilege. You're opening up a whole can of worms. Worms. If you get it wrong, you potentially uh, escalate the conflict because now people are thinking that you're lying about what your lawyer said, or your lawyer must be incompetent if they told you that, or, or you know, who's 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 the, who's the bigger idiot, you or your lawyer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We don't need to go into any of that. So. Um, Appeals to authority are, are not particularly helpful if you want to uh, keep the uh, conversation uh, focused on positive outcomes. Um, similarly, you don't need evidence to support your case because it comes across as aggressive and argumentative. And really, you're not making a case in front of a, a judge here. What you're doing is trying to convince somebody to... to um, um, make a decision based on your request. And going back to that, that uh, the idea that you want the person to be able to think for themselves, that's a healthy attitude. They can think for themselves. They don't need you uh, waving the evidence around in their face. Um, similarly, references to what has happened in the past. Well, the past is the past. If you stop referencing the past, you're more likely to get a positive outcome. Uh, and when you do uh, reference what has happened in the past, what, what you're likely to do is trigger an argument about the past. And, and then you're off and running on an argument about uh, the past, the evidence, and you know, or, or like I said before, the, you know, your lawyer must be an idiot for telling you that, et cetera, et cetera. None of those have, all of those arguments have, have completely diverted the issue, which was, I just wanted to pick up the kids early for this special program. You know, what do you have to say? Right. And so you don't need to get into a long song and a dance about it. Okay. The longer it is, the weaker your request looks because the person getting their request is going, my God, this must not be a very um, reasonable request that they've got to spend this much effort trying to buttress the, their, uh, their argument, okay? And really, really bad. Don't put in any threats or don't even <laughs> call them promises. Uh, you know, that's just, again, more bullying behavior. Um, if you... Um, I always say that the scariest thing in any event is, is the thing that the person doesn't uh, see coming. Um, and you don't need to put in the threats. You know, you know I'm going to tell the judge that you're not being reasonable is um, all it invites is the person to say, hmm, okay, well, you try it. And now we're having a, having a fight over who's going to win at, at, in court not a particularly productive kind of argument. Um, uh, better to have the person think, you know, this is a straightforward request. Uh, he's explained what it is that I need to know. He's not given any indication. There's no, there's no, um, there's no target here. There's nothing for me to attack. And he's just asked me to say, um, you know, give some comment or say yes or no. Um, now, if I don't respond to a reasonable request in a reasonable, balanced way, then I wonder what might happen to me. That's what the kind of thinking you want to induce in the other side. And as soon as they, as soon as you uh, put that threat or promise in there, then you will um, get. The the other person think through the issues based on a very straightforward clean uh email and of course obviously the next one is you, you avoid the insults the bad language etc because it really doesn't get anywhere and in fact it's just like the rest of it if you've got to uh resort to insults and bad language it must not be a very reasonable request because otherwise you wouldn't feel the need for it similarly you know, you don't want this, whatever this communication is, you don't want it copied and stuck in an affidavit or put in front of a judge because it's just going to make you look bad more than the other person. Uh, 
I often say when 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 I get as lawyers, we sometimes have to deal with other lawyers that 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 don't know these rules, which is interesting. Whenever I see another lawyer violating this this stuff and making uh, personal attacks on me, et cetera, et cetera, I just calm right down and I just think, you know, they must not have a very strong case if they're having to re resort to this kind of stuff. So if it works for me in in terms of my my work as a litigator, it certainly can can work for for you guys out there just trying to have a straightforward communication. So here's a, here's a little thought here. We should always act with compassion and respect. And uh, when you take responsibility for others' feelings, you surrender the possibility of both solving problems and connecting deeply. Um, and and uh, so there's, um, hopefully that's lots uh, to think about. I think we've been chatting here for half an hour. Um, the, um, there's the name of the book by Edel Smarts uh, that, um, oops. Oh, this is back to you, Tannis. Here's some, here's some <laughs> things here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <Here's my. laughs> yeah. We've, we've got just a couple more quick things that I'll, I'll, I'll make it fast. Cause I know that you're trying to move into the question section here. So the first thing we already kind of went over the taking time to breathe. So, so counting to counting to five or 10 before responding um, in written communication as well. Like it, it, you know, that text message example that you provided, maybe before sending any kind of text message to, to somebody, if you're feeling angry, instead of responding to them directly, it might be helpful instead to take some time and maybe write it down in a Word document or even in a journal or something. And then by the time you've taken time to write it down that way, you know, you can think, hmm, maybe I can say this a little bit better. <laughs> I, I have a drafts folder filled with draft emails that I have not press send on. And afterwards, I thought, you know, I'm real happy I didn't press send on that one. Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so that kind of goes in along with the next one. So, so being, you know, clear and and calm rather than reacting in anger. So really taking that. Bonding, if at all possible, you know it's it's not it's not always possible, especially when you're sitting right before somebody. But, um, yeah, basically using that that calm and controlled voice, um, you know, not not speaking too loudly, um, not being reactive as much as possible. If the other person is behaving in that reactive manner, you know, you, you don't want to fall into that. You want to try instead to model the kind of behavior you would like to see in them. So not only would that reflect on you, uh, that would reflect well on you, but it can indeed bring the other person down to a state of calm. So if you have somebody lashing out and getting up in your face and you're just sitting there, you know, arms ar arms folded nicely being like, okay, so how can we solve this problem? They're going to feel mighty silly if they, if they keep coming at you super aggressive, right? Um, so whenever you're talking, if possible, and if relevant, of course, it's always best to kind of use I feel language. So this helps to avoid looking like you're putting the blame on the other person. So for example, instead of saying, you know, you're making this way more difficult than it needs to be, saying, I feel that this is more difficult than it needs to be, or something like that. It avoids language that puts the other person on the defensive. So that's that's a good one to to keep note of. And also with body language, um, you know, you don't want to come on too strong. You don't want to be aggressive, making a lot of, you know, big gestures, avoid holding your arms or, or clenching your fists. Um, so behaving in as much of a calm and controlled manner as possible, making gestures slowly. Um, and, you know, as one final note, um, this does not mean acting meek or cowed, but just being confident and in control without being domineering. Yeah, and like going back to that winner's triangle, the one in the top left, I think, was, was assertive. So mm -hmm. the, don't uh, mistake kindness for weakness. This is not um, being kind and being controlled of your... You know, in control of your emotions, etc., is not a sign of weakness or that you are going to be sacrificing something that uh, you otherwise shouldn't be sacrificing. So, yeah. So, um, questions and answers.
I don't know. Well, questions anyway. So hopefully, maybe we might not have answers. So there you go. Okay. Uh, so the first question we have is, uh, in a high conflict situation, if we want to record the conversation, can we do it without informing the other party or person? Okay, I guess I'll take this one. So, really, it depends what. Here's what the problem is with, with uh, recordings is if the other person doesn't know that you're recording, then you are going to be um, uh, in control of how you are responding. And of course, they don't know that you're recording. So you could push their buttons, press, um, so to speak, and then press the record button. And uh, you've caught them and they're all wound up. And you come across looking as a saint because after all, you've got the, the recording going. Um, the uh, courts have mixed views on this, and I have seen uh, cases where parties have been uh, castigated for uh, engaging in um, surreptitious recording of the other party. That being said, I've also been in court where a judge has actually said, well, you know, if there's conflict between the parties during the, the exchanges, uh, you can always record the exchanges. That was in a uh, provincial court with an experienced um, uh, senior judge in the family uh, family um, uh, court. I was actually surprised at that answer because there, I'm not convinced that it is um, a good idea. Now, what if you're doing the recording and the other person knows? Well, now you're just in their face and um, clearly that, that's an aggressive move uh, because you are trying to get uh, evidence against them. Um, the other thing to remember is that when you, you might be recording uh, this interchange and that's really good, but what about the other interchange where you did lose control that you weren't recording or you did record it and realize, ah, eh, we better not disclose that one or I better press delete on that one. So as, as um, I, probably the only thing that you can maybe take away from that is if you're recording, you're more likely to stay calm and um, and behave yourself, and that's probably a positive thing. But you know, I'm not uh, convinced that in general recording is a good idea. Although um, in some situations it 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 can be. Um, uh, in fact, I just uh, dealing with a, a client recently where. Um, the, the recording is probably necessary uh, in order to avoid the, uh, the, the uh, false accusations. It's important uh, to uh, be smart about how you do it and how you disclose it. Um, and, you know, that's, I, I would really want to get legal advice as you go on that. Sorry for the long answer. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay, um, this question is probably geared to Tanis. How do you manage your tone, delivery, and body language when working through conflict? It can be very tricky. When when working. Okay, Melanie, are you there? Sorry, my, my internet's acting. Okay, should I repeat the question? Yes, please. Okay, sorry. Um, how do you manage your tone delivery and body language when working through conflict? Okay, um, well, I mean, when, when working through conflict, a, a good thing um, is, like, especially before going into any meetings, you know, what, what I would say is, like, first of all, try and have some kind of strategies that you can think of to kind of keep control of um, yourself in the moment. So, for example, one thing that was taught to me is, you know, if, if you're feeling nervous or out of control, like having some kind of physical, um, like, reaction that you can that you can turn to to kind of keep control because 
um, when we're thinking about something, it's it's actually very difficult for the brain to to truly multitask. We often think we're multitasking, but you know we're we're really not. So one of the suggestions they did was something very small, like in the moment where you can like rub your your the back of your hand, or you can you know pinch the underside of your hand if you're sitting sitting like with your hands like this on the table, just something to kind of keep yourself grounded. Because a lot of the times when we're in, we're, we're in a situation when we're talking to somebody and the, the conflict is high and we're, we're really, you know, feeling out of control, having something to ground us and keep us in the moment is, is really important. So when we're kind of engaging in the, the physical um, touch that we're doing there, that can kind of help us to keep separated from the, the moment and um, keep us in our own heads rather than letting us letting ourselves fly off the handle in conflict. So that's one strategy. Um, another thing I would say is to be prepared beforehand as well. You know, go into meetings thinking about what it is that you would like to achieve and talk to the other person, you know, as though you're trying to solve a problem, like I had mentioned before, um, you know, avoid any kind of personal attacks, um, even, you know, you can even talk to the other person and say, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to attack you. I just, I just want to solve this problem together, that kind of thing. Using that kind of collaborative language, even when they're being high. To your level. I mean, otherwise, you know, you're just sitting there trying to maintain your calm and you have this person beaking off at you and it probably really doesn't reflect very well on them, right? So those are, are, are just some general tips that I would suggest. You know, there's a lot more we could go into, but it, it's kind of a big question. Yeah, you know, I think um, uh, just stopping and saying, you know, what is this other person actually saying or what are they feeling or just, or, you know, ask a question. Uh, reorient to um, uh, listening to what's going on with them. Uh, you know, it doesn't mean that you're giving up anything. You're just listening. And, um, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, so next question, um, this is probably geared towards Charles. Um, it's situational. So my ex fits the profile of the constant victim. I have repeatedly asked to pick up the kids early each week to attend activities like Girl Guides. We are late every week because she refuses to allow me to pick up the kids even five minutes early. How do you respond when the other party always says no to your request? When does it turn into a harassment situation to repeatedly make this request week after week? Well, I think um, repeatedly uh, asking the question is uh, probably not an effective strategy because um, you're, you're, uh, what it says is that you're not listening. She said no, and now that doesn't necessarily mean that um, you haven't heard the no, but you haven't discovered the why behind the no. And, and I think that that's, um, uh, you know, the one definition of crazy is if you keep doing the same thing and getting the same result, um, then, then, you know, that's the definition of crazy. So if you don't want to be crazy, you've got to try something different. And that's where you need to open up a, a communication where the other person feels safe to tell you what's really the concern. It may be, for example, that somebody is, is uh, afraid that your request for a little bit earlier pickup is the proverbial camel's nose in the tent. And if they give an inch, then the next thing you know, there's gonna be, uh, they're, they're gonna lose custody of their, their children. And, and, you know, and, and who knows what the, what the fear is, or maybe they, they're just wanting to be vindictive and, and, and just be mean about it. Well, how, how do you know what that is? Or maybe they're just, they're, they're itching for a fight and they're really upset with you because you're not actually uh, fighting with them. I, and so trying to figure out what's actually going on in the conflict is really important, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, it, it, it's tough to say, even if, if they are
prosecutor role in that situation, right? Like Charles said, and you don't know if they're just trying to be <laughs> trying to be difficult and and make things hard on you, or they they could be being the victim, or you know they there might be legitimately some other reason why they're um, they're refusing to. But but yeah, trying to really communicate with them and and say you know you know, maybe what, what is the reason behind this? You know, can, can we work something out? That's, it's not always going to work, but that's really the best, the best bet I would say to, to try and figure that out. One way to do it might be to take a guess and say, um, are you worried that this is, um, this is going to lead to more requests or something, or mm -hmm. is there something that, that, um, is, is, um, um, you don't have to. You have to say it in a safe and, and inviting way. You could say, you know, um, you don't say something like, a, you know, is there some reason why you can't do this? That sounds a little on the aggressive side. But you could say, you know, is there um, is there something uh, that that maybe I could help with to, so that we could get this happening? Because it might be because it, you know, maybe it's better for the kids if if we can get this to this program earlier. Okay, sorry. Um, so next question, it's another situational one. My ex-partner constantly contacts me, tries to push my buttons, provokes an emotional reaction from me that she could use in an ongoing court custody case. Lately, she uses the pretense of our son to get me up into conflict-filled conversations. Can I tell her to back off? She may use this in court against me as she would say, that when she approached me about our son's day, daycare, I told her to back off. Yeah, well, I can tell you that the um, that, that strategy um, didn't work very well in that case that I mentioned um, uh, that was just decided this year. Um, the, uh, the, the dad in that case was threatening the, uh, the mom with a, a defamation lawsuit if she didn't stop, you know? So it sounds like you're trying to draw a line, but um, going back to what you started before, uh, um, she's not the one in control of your buttons. And maybe Tannis can have some more comments about that. Yeah. So, I mean, I, when, when I think about that kind of thing, I think about, you know, trying to kind of envision yourself as, as sort of a fortress, right? Like if, if this person is constantly, you know, trying to to push your buttons and and you're just hopping right on the that drama situation with them, right? It's it's easy to to kind of lose yourself to uselessly throwing arrows at you, right? You can kind of envision it as this person is trying to to make me back down or or trying to trying to weaken me, but I, I'm, I'm going to, to hold up, hold up and hold my ground. You know, I, I would call this part of the assertive role on the winner's triangle, right? It's, it's like, I'm, you know, no, I'm, I'm willing to work with you on this, but, but we, we have to come to a, a solution collaboratively, right? And then by holding that kind of self, self-assertive ground and having this, this vision of yourself as, as this wall that won't back down, then it can be a little bit easier to kind of, um, you know, envision that you're holding your strength in, in the face of somebody who's trying to, to throw pebbles at you. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's not always easy. I, I know it's, it's easy to say that from a place of, of distance, but as much as possible, trying to hold that sense of, you know, that sense of assertiveness, that sense of confidence, um, it, it can allow you to, you know, hold your ground and to, to try and assert your, your own needs and, and your own desires without falling into anger. Um, one funny strategy that Ken use is you, uh, is you agree with the person about what it is. Now, you have to think about this uh, carefully, but if you agree with the person's criticism and they keep criticizing you with the same thing over and over again, uh, it, they start to realize that this is um, uh, kind of fruitless because you, you haven't reacted to their, to their um, button pushing. You know, yeah. they say, oh, you never do this. You say, you know, you're right, I never do that. 
<laughs> and, and, <laughs> what are they going to say next? I mean, <laughs> you never help with the dishes. You're right. I don't help with the dishes. <laughs> well, and I mean, not only not only is that kind of a, a defanging strategy, but I mean, you know, best case scenario, the other person winds up feeling a little bit more heard or something, and it's like they're able to to vent and that they, you know, their their concerns are being maybe taken more seriously, and that they may be more willing to to work with you on things, right? So a lot of times these places of conflict, they're coming from places of hurt, right? So. Um, if you can kind of get them to a point where they feel like, you know, they're actually being heard or something like that, then that may wind up being a positive strategy for you as well. Yeah, I mean, it's like anything else. I mean, you don't really know why they're throwing those those stones at you, you know, so uh, agree with them and then and then they feel heard and, you know, and, and, you know, you have to be careful about this, you know, you don't, you know. Uh, if they're yeah. saying, you know, <laughs> you know, you assaulted our son, you know, I just say, well, okay. Um, so we've just got a couple more minutes left. So we got a couple questions to throw in here quick. Um, are there any guidelines we should follow when dealing with women versus men in conflict? How do men and women differ? Men and women differ in how they handle it. I'm going to jump in here really quick here before Tana says anything. Sure. I, I, I'm not, I think these things are not gender specific. So, but Tannis might disagree with me on that. Um, yeah. No, I was going to, I was going to say, I think it, it really depends on the person because, you know, I, I have met both men and women that, that are prone to like big angry reactions. And I've also met men and women that are, that are trying to be calm and reasonable about things. Right. So it, I think it, it really more depends on the kind of person that you're dealing with. So if, if you, you know, if you're working with somebody that, you know, maybe has a bit of a history of, of being angry, then, you know, then you can go into strategies or go into um, the con the conflict, knowing that this is somebody who's um, who's going to be potentially angry and work accordingly with that. But I, I don't. I, I agree with Charles. I re I really don't think it's necessarily a gendered thing. I think it's more of an individual thing. Well, that's okay. good. Thank you, Dennis. Yeah. <laughs> okay, sounds great. Um, Vanessa uh, is going to pop on here. She's got a question she wanted to ask. Thanks, Melanie. So it's um, it's possible that I missed something when I was listening to the presentation. Uh, Charles, I was wondering about this three-sentence rule. Uh, so you said that you should keep your, your written communication to three sentences, sometimes four. And uh, so you outlined the first three, and I don't recall you saying what that sometimes fourth sentence would be. Sometimes the information needed to make the, a decision on the request might require two sentences. Oh, okay. Maybe even three. <laughs> okay. But the idea is you want to keep that section short, right? Mm -hmm. It's that middle part that, that often runs the risk of... of uh, of getting out of control. And by the time you've finished venting, whatever it is you're gonna vent in that sandwich, uh, you, you, you may even have forgot to ask what it is that you want them to do at the end of it. So that's, that's partly the, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. But great question, thank you. I should have said that before. Okay, so um, we're up for time. So Vanessa, did you wanna wrap up? for the, the time that you've put into this presentation and all the presentations that you've done with us. And thank you very much, Tanis, for joining us. You have a very valuable point of view uh, that adds some, some, great, uh, some, some great information and also a lot of heart. Uh, I've, I've long thought of you as the heart of CCMF Alberta. So oh, I'm... So <laughs> I'm just a big fan of Tannis. So uh, this, uh, <laughs> this has been uh, communication styles to avoid escalations. 
with CCMF Alberta. And I'd like you to uh, please, if you enjoyed this presentation, uh, or if you didn't, because you're under way too much stress with your family situation, please uh, visit our website at ccmfalberta.ca and read about our program offerings, uh, including legal seminars like this one and uh, different peer support groups for men, domestic violence support and counseling, among other things. So please visit us and see what we can do to help you support your mental health. Thanks everyone for coming. Thank oh yes, and, and uh, yes, go ahead, Melanie, let, give us your spiel about fair legal just before we sign off. <laughs> um, yeah, so if anybody is, um, you know, wants to set up a consultation, um, please feel free to visit our website at www.fairlegal.ca um, and we can get you set up with a free consultation um, to see if there's uh, something that we can help you with.